here where the convex, the concave rod pulls this side up, convex rod through a cantilever uh, maneuver pushes this side down and in effect helps with derotation. I think that's really what the, uh, the rail thing system does as well. Uh, so you can take a 100 degree curve here uh, with fairly normal kyphosis and uh, that lumbar curve does not straighten out. And you can go to L3 pretty, pretty readily. Now, we actually contoured, this is the concave rod and it's actually flatter than this less contoured convex rod and that's what happens and this is a cobalt chrome rod over many segments, it still flattens out. So the long fusions really are associated with that, but the lowest instrumented vertebra, L3, is horizontal, and uh, we've got three motion segments at least. So the way I do these is the f there's an option to use a short rod here, uh, particularly if you had a very significant proximal curve. You can do a short rod, and then the second rod uh, comes in here, a long rod, and that's the hyper contoured rod. And then you take the short rod out, and in comes rod number three, which is hy hypo contoured, and uh, get that result. Here's another case, a, a, a larger proximal curve. Uh, this is basically a, a lengthy six, really. Uh, and uh, again, going to L3. So, what about uh, the rationale for selective fusions and not fusing? Uh, the lumbar component of a, of a double major curve. We, we have the imperfect cochrane ockhamson data, some of which suggests that uh, longer fusions result in more back pain and disc degeneration. We have the hour back uh, in vitro pressure measurements that we did last year or presented last year. And Michelle Marks has presented range of motion data on uh, post-operative patients. And then Peter Newton talks about the flexibility deformity quotient, which is uh, something I'll show you in a minute. So Josh's experiment really looked at uh, differing uh, distal fusion levels and assessing uh, intradiscal disc pressure with flexion extension maneuvers following uh, variable levels of instrumentation. We use these pressure transducers in the disc. And basically the take home meshes, message of that study was that uh, the pressure increased in unfused discs with increasing fusion lengths. And the highest pressures were in the, the, the discs adjacent to the end instrumented vertebra. And L4-5 and L5-S1 uh, uh, segments do not see increased pressure until an LIV of L4 is reached. So this suggests the importance of stopping at L3 rather than L4. It at least gives us in vitro uh, information for that. And uh, this is the first study uh, that uh, quantifies the degree of relative protection of adjacent levels uh, afforded by saving a level. And then Michelle Marks looked at range of motion following uh, distal levels of fusion. And I find this information helpful in counseling patients. And I think the question is though for patients, somebody today mentioned they were in China. Oh, I think it was Jim. And the Chinese surgeons and uh, patients don't like, don't like the look of this. They, they want this. They think that looks a lot better. And, you know, so uh, Peter did this study, which I guess uh, Paul Harrington introduced this concept many years ago as well, looking at the residual curve versus the unfused distal motion segments preserved. So we can make the spine perfectly straight but leave less motion segments or we can leave some residual curve but leave all these distal motion segments and what is better and what Peter found, well first of all the surgeons in our group that looked at this, we preferred the latter where we preserved more motion segments even though we didn't make the lumbar spine straight. That was just our opinion but apparently the SRS 24 scores in, in patients that he evaluated were higher for patients who had lower deformity flexibility quotients, meaning uh, less deformity, more unfused motion segments. Anyway, just an interesting concept. So here, John, I, I did something a little bit unusual here in this case. This was a patient with an 82 degree lumbar curve, maybe L3, maybe L4 is the lowest vertebra here, and a 92 degree curve. So I did a thoracoscopic release for the upper curve 
I uh, and did then turned the patient to the other side and did a anterior instrumentation, um, which allowed me to really push the, this apex over down to L2, and then we overlapped in the back to L3. We did all that, that in one day. And she's about eight or ten years out now and s still doing very well. So I, I'm not sure I could have gotten that over as well if I had not gone to the thoraco uh, through an anterior approach here, if I could have gone to L3 and made it come around that well. So I really have not been doing very many of these anterior approaches, but I, after today, might revisit that. And here's a, a lengthy 1C, the case I showed earlier, where I think it's a, a fairly straightforward to, to do these now selectively, and uh, uh, that patients uh, and a dancer and has done very well. Um, and here's another one, just to hammer home the point of selective fusion. Here's a nearly 50 degree lumbar curve with significant rotation, uh, but clinically there wasn't a big rotational prominence there and we did a selective fusion. I also did a thoracoscopic release on this particular patient, and uh, she has a very nice clinical result with very minimal lumbar deformity. And uh, so uh, Ritzman looked at uh, what happens when you do a selective fusion. If you're doing, when doing a selective thoracic fusion, what is the fate of the unfused lumbar curve and vice versa doing a lumbar fusion, the fate of the unfused thoracic curve? and found a very significant coronal plane correction of 53% of the lumbar curve just spontaneously without instrumentation and a nearly 50% improvement in rotation. So we know that all motion is coupled in the spine. So with the coronal improvement uh, spontaneously, the axial plane improved by 50% as well. Not as good in the thoracic spine when doing a lumbar fusion. So for a lengthy six curve, 41% uh, coronal plane correction and, and minimal. So if patients have a significant thoracic rotational prominence, probably best to do both curves in those situations. And uh, here's a, a lengthy three curve in which we did uh, both curves because the patient clinically had a significant deformity of both. And here he is. You can see the lumbar uh, region here with a very significant rotational prominence, kind of a high uh, thoracal lumbar lumbar curve and he looks much better post-operatively. And here's a case of a 1C in which we did, we did this uh, through a thoracoscopic approach. And, uh, you know, she's got some residual curve, but she's well balanced and has her flexibility preserved. Um, here's a triple curve, and uh, we did all three curves. And that's what she looks like clinically. So Bert, I think, looked this up as for a chapter we were doing on double and triple curves uh, in AIS. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's fairly basic, but what you can see is that lengthy three, four, and six, and this is a database now at the time Bert looked this up, there were 1,200 patients in the database with a minimum of a two-year follow-up. And only 4% had uh, of the total had lengthy threes, three and a half, and 5.4 for fours and six. So this is really not a big portion of the population. Uh, their major curve sizes are here, 65, 78, 62, and 15 out of the 156, only 15 had selective fusions for these true double and triple uh, major curves. The surgical approaches are here. Most of them, 64% were posterior. Um, here's a case, a patient with a very uh, widely translated angular uh, uh, apex of the thoracic lumbar spine, whom we did a uh, vertebral column resection. You can see the widely deviated apex and truncal shift, and uh, did a vertebral column resection at the apex of that uh, deformity uh, and uh, balanced him. So, selective fusions again in this series were done uh, in uh, 15 of the 156 patients total. 13 of these were done through complete anterior, so anterior approaches for both the thoracic and thoracal lumbar components. So anybody know who did that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Professor Harms. So uh, I don't think he's doing those anymore. That, I think that's a big hit to the patient, but we, we did that one case that I did the same thing and then overlapped it posteriorly. But most of these were done uh, uh, over at his site. So uh, the curves, 
60 percent, 70 per 60 to 70 percent correction of both the major and the secondary curves were noted. The fusion levels between uh, 10 and 13 uh, levels fused, and good correction of, of coronal plane. And SRS uh, score improvement for all curve types were noted. A two-year follow-up. Uh, there were these sort of general uh, complications noted. To, uh, two patients, um, yeah, two patients of the 15 that were selectively fused required an extension of the fusion to include those uh, structural curves that were initially untreated, and one patient required a, a, a um, pseudoarthrosis repair. So, in summary, uh, this group of patients.